Today I'm going to interview Jordan Shanks, maybe the most famous independent voice in Australia at the moment. Jordan Shanks. Harvey Yemeni's up there, but yeah. Harvey I'll, Yemeni. Uh, I'll go for it. You, you can see him competition. That'd be an interesting interview, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many followers is Harvey It's a small pool, man. It's Australia. <laughs> And uh, so how many, you've got about 500,000 followers? Uh, 600,000, thank you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do have that. I don't know actually, because this is the whole thing about social media. Who's where, who's doubling up, I don't know. There are fake numbers, etc. Yeah, 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 bots and all of that. For China, the, you know, they do that. For those uh, American uh, viewers, that's a lot anyway. You have a lot of clout. And I think one of the, the things that, brought it home to how much clout you had is when you were uh, sued by a politician, was it? And you raised a million dollars in, as far as I could work out that, you know, days, was it a week? How long did it take you to raise a million dollars? Oh. God, it, you know what? Uh, I'd have to check to get the facts right, but I think it was a day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that was pretty cool. And in Australian terms, that's, that's record breaking. That's, uh, uh, yeah. that's some clout. And you can buy a quarter of a house in Sydney with that. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so let's run through your story. Mm. Uh, where did you grow up? All over the place. I had hippie slash poor parents. Uh, but where did I start growing up? It's all a hazy memory now. I don't know, like Balmain, uh, Billingen. Marrickville, and that's about it. So quite it's not easy. that many places now that I think about it. Oh, well, you yeah, know, for a kid, <laughs> that's quite a lot. But, yeah, tumultuous. Um, uh, were you the comedian at school? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, I was the class clown. And I had hoop dreams from quite early on of being a comedian, and I guess mission accomplished now <laughs> and uh yeah that's that's like god you know what now that i think about it some of my earliest memories as a kid was sitting around in uh kindergarten being like how do i pull attention away from the teacher and put it on me it is interesting <laughs> I've, I've heard it said i don't know it's the catholic church but i've heard it said that what you want to be when you're seven is what you either will be or what you secretly always want to be. Mm, so show that, me the boy, eh? Yeah, show me the boy kind of did thing. Did you want to be a soldier? Yeah, I did. I did kind of want to be a soldier, although I was a bit conflicted about whether I wanted to be Easy Rider or something, but basically a soldier. <laughs> always was obsessed. And it's quite strange because my parents were soldiers. They were doctors and they weren't – there was no real culture of soldiering in, uh, in my near relatives, but for some reason I was attracted to it, yeah. And uh, you don't know why? I don't know why. The movies or whatever. But some of it is um, uh, is hard to replace. We had we found some medals, my father's First World War medals, and uh, I was fascinated with even when at a young age. Yeah, I, I loved the idea. When uh, I was seven, and we were flying to France for my father to get an award, and. Uh, in those days, they used to have set movies in bit different parts of the plane, and there was a comedy, Paint Your Wagon, in our part of the plane, and there was Patton, the war movie. And I snuck through the curtains, and so I could see that war movie. You know, I thought that that was really, yeah, so it's unbelievable. It's strange. You know, they thought that that was strange. A little kid wanted to go and watch it. Uh, so, As yeah. you said, especially with nothing around you yeah. in your environment. Yeah, there was it. no, like, dad, my, you know, my parents we, we were not into that at all, you know, both, yeah. both medical professionals, and so there was no encouragement from them. They were slightly bemused that I'd be turning pages of World War, you know, looking at pictures of World War II. They thought it was, they thought it was mildly funny, I guess, yeah. <laughs> they, well, I couldn't work out where this person had come from. <laughs> So, I know this is supposed to be my interview, but yeah. I've also got to ask that. Do you think that that's why you were not a cookie-cut soldier? Yeah. You were I, a free I, thinker. I, that's funny enough because I'm right, trying to write my book at the moment um, and that comes up that I was uh, – it, it was 
70% I wanted to be a soldier, but to a certain extent, I wanted to be a slightly different, I always had that kind of rebel streak in me as well. You wanted to be Rambo. I want to be Rambo or Clint Eastwood, you know, in, in the sense, the kind of bad soldier. The guy, the soldier that sort of takes the orders but does his own thing. <laughs> Plays by his own rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, unfortunately, I've become, I've become a little bit more Rambo, <laughs> a little bit more the psychotic loner, <laughs> getting run out of town, covering myself with mud. That's amazing, yes. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I do sometimes laugh about that. Uh, I have a laugh at my own expense. How you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, well, yeah, yeah. You're a classic yeah. example of it. Show yeah. me the boy. <laughs> and uh, you probably are as well. So it's interesting. But you're obviously. I've heard you talking about Julius Caesar in our pre pre chat. So you did you do any study at school or did you self educate? You're pretty smart, obviously. Well, thank you. I don't think I am. I think that that is actually the only thing that I have. I, I honestly think I'm an idiot. I think that I just read a lot to make myself less stupid. Um, <laughs> and yes, but actually, the reason that I am doing that show is because I always did have a fascination with ancient Rome. And then when I got older, my fascination became media bias and, you know, as Chris so can attest, I never shut up about either of them. But I read a book that was a combination of the two. And that's just been... I, I, I've actually become stupider in the last six weeks because I've just... I feel like a bird in a cage and I understand why they say, hello, all the time because I'm sitting there talking to myself, repeating the same lines over and over. I, I'm not a, an ancient Rome fanatic. Or I, I don't know much about it, but I did read a book a few years ago, which I thought was fascinating. It was about the, the real politics of Rome. And there, were, there did seem to be striking parallels in that there were some people who were really good at rabble-rousing populism and the way to, um, to get a, elected or, uh, was often to, to go on a foreign campaign and, and trash some fuzzy-wuzzies and bring back their gold. Mm. And um, increasingly... Uh, those that tried to do this by raising all of my, ended it ended badly for them, mm. and and uh, that was the beginning of the end. And they were getting more, uh, you know, more completely lack of ethics, and just going to find anyone to go and conquer, and then come back and, and use it totally in some uh, very cynical way. And and then the fates intervene. A lot of the time, they'd end up all dead in the desert, you know, despite this very. Uh, uh, expensive campaign that struck me as struck and then the empire was about to fall down you know mm. and they also had extreme differences between the uh, the wealthy and the poor and the, I was surprised to read that even however now what 2,000 years ago they had big aquariums and people were competing about the size of their villa uh, things that you would read today you know that you would think wow you really had uh, Celebrity chefs, yeah, yeah, celebrity yeah. sports stars. Yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff was going on there. Mm, um, mm. And just bef just before it all went wrong. Mm. And uh, so you, you become, you start doing stand-up at a young age, do you? Uh, 12, I think, was my first gig. That is no, right. I lie. 14. 14 it was. It was Class Clowns. <laughs> which was just something that the Melbourne Comedy Festival chucked in as a thing for class clowns. The junior, junior level. Yeah, the junior leagues. I was in junior master chef for uh, stand-up comics. I would prefer to say Australian schoolboys for uh, <laughs> comics. Yeah, that's quite, <laughs> that's quite an accolade. I always wanted that for rugby, but that's that. And, so you, and, and did you go from there? You got enough encouragement to think, I can, I can make a career of this or something. Yeah, I did. I did. And when did you do your YouTube? When did you first start YouTube? I started YouTube because I thought my ultimate goal originally, because I'm from a different time. Actually, I was in this weird little interim twilight period, I suppose, where YouTube started to become professionalized, but I was from the age where you'd go into radio and television. Hmm. But radio and television was dying. And I started doing internships at those places and they were horrible. Mm. It was just a really terrible, and also, you know when an institution starts shrinking and everyone starts becoming 
<laughs> the kids in fucking Lord of the Flies. You yeah, know? like it, you could it, tell it, it, everyone it, it, was just terrified and yeah. wanted to you yeah. jump the other person. It was, yeah. I, I went into that environment, and first off, I didn't have the connections, and you know, it's a very nepotistic mm. thing. Yeah. And uh, so, I after a while thought I'm not going to be continuing to do internships. I'm just going to go on YouTube for a while. And I found it the other day actually as well in the Facebook group chat of my friends when I first started out and it was merciless. Yeah. I had to just cut myself out from that. And that was a good lesson for the rest of the internet actually. It's <laughs> just don't look at the comments. It is an important <laughs> lesson to learn. We were talking about it last night, uh, the cameraman, to say uh, you do have to just do stuff and not worry about, you know, uh, what people will think. if Because if you don't start, you don't practice, you're never going to go anywhere. No, uh, no. And, uh, you, um, when was the first uh, video that, that started to get significant views? It actually was a political video. I did a spoof ad campaign of, you know, the classic, like, if Labor gets elected, your taxes are going to go up. I did... <laughs> <laughs> and I was really proud of it. I went back and looked at it and I was like, fuck, that was actually a really good video. But that one got traction. And then, because it was just scattergun, constantly doing shotgun things, one of my friends just said, you should continue to do the politics because you're actually knowledgeable on it. I did a degree in it. In fact, that made me less knowledgeable on it, actually. Um, but you should be doing that. And then I started actually paying attention to the political landscape in Australia and I realised this is probably almost unheard of in the Western world, but there is no media outlet that props up the opposition. That's quite absurd. That is a, that is a level of media control that is probably closer akin to third world dictatorships where there's pretty much just a monopoly on media output supporting the party in power. Um, and then I just started to look into it more and I realised, yeah, they're, they're pumping out a lot of shit. <laughs> and they're lying a lot. And, and then I just started going down that traction more and reviewing maths a lot as well. That's good. And that, <laughs> which, which gets the, the more views, the math stuff or the politics or is it both? I think it goes in cycles. In fact, it was Will Anderson that observed this, which is that it depends if society is tense or if society is relaxed, you know? If society is relaxed, people are like, I don't want to pay attention to that, you know, yeah. my life is fine. When you're in something like COVID, for instance, and everything's just, everyone's getting really pissed off and you're getting agitation and people are actually paying attention to politics, that gets more views. Yeah. Cycles. But the two go together though and people watch your political stuff because they're, they're, they may have watched the, the, the math stuff or whatever and, and, um, and, and the two breed off each other. I mean that's, that's one of the things that struck me is it's important that you realise a lot of people like myself, I, I've wanted to do YouTube stuff for a while but you, uh, in order to get reach you've got to be, well you don't necessarily have to be funny but you do, you do have to have something which is going to draw people in. You can write an yeah. opinion piece to the Australian and, and the chin, I often thought about this when I was trying it, before I actually became a whistleblower, I could have written an opinion piece in Australia or the Herald, they would have published it. But it would have, only people would have read it would have been the sort of chin scratches who would have gone, oh that's very interesting. It would have ruined my career and uh, it wouldn't have achieved anything. Um, but <laughs> But you know, it's a very fair summation. Yeah, and yet, because the, the, actually, the people who really will not help you are the middle class, educated chin scratchers. Go, <laughs> but there's another point of view, <laughs> yes, and, and then yes. you know, because they are actually, uh, they will not help. No, I found that you know, no. all the people that kind of I grew up with, whatever, they are, they will not help. They would let you burn. You know, mm, oh, yeah, well, another point of view, of course. <laughs> I like appearing like a decent person, but acting on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm not going to need to vote for the person that makes charges me less tax. <laughs> but, um, I'm a big fan of that as a summary of those people, yeah, chin yeah. scratches. Yeah, well, You've true. identified yeah. it well. Yeah, it it took me a are. long time. They've got a few behind me that would not 
if, and that, you know, I say that as a and people that you would think would help you, but are really not that interested. And they would chin scratch and go, hmm, well, of course, there's another point of view. Yes, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. I need all the facts before. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah. Someone yeah. I'd known for 40 years uh, called me up out of the blue and he said, uh, I didn't know whether I was going to support you. There was some quite negative stuff on the internet. This is someone I've went to school with. And he said, but I, I, I think, but now that the sort of things had swung around and he was like, yeah, I, I'm beginning to think that maybe you're quite all right. Right. Because <laughs> the 7.30 report was yeah, mildly yeah, sympathetic the, Yeah, exactly, you, because the, he yeah. thought the atmospherics had swung. Oh, my God. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> but, but and these said, are the educated types. Not, yeah, that's, that's what worried me. These are, yeah. the, these are the people that should be saving Australia, the people with it, multiple degrees, went to the right schools, um, and have a bit of money that they don't have to worry about a roof over their head. And you reckon that they'd be saying, no, nah, enough's enough. This is the principle. But actually, they're the you, you get more traction from the everyday Australian who, exactly. us, who says, that's fine. Yeah. That sounds like that's fucked, mate. Yeah. Than someone who you would expect, who, who's meant to say, oh, well, that's, we have rules, we have laws, you know, we need to. Uh, There's yeah, two surprising. factors at play there. It really is. First off, they have an ego around themselves uh, and also that kind of like status in society, I suppose, that they're trying to protect, which I really do think is the underlying current there. But the other thing is, as I learned in university, you are trained to be an idiot in these sort of degrees, mm -hmm. in, the, in these highfalutin degrees. And if, I can imagine it. If I was in a bureaucratic job for the next 20 years, no offence to bureaucrats because they obviously do a lot of good work, but you are trained to think in a certain way and all the conditioning starts winding in. And, and I think that's like what's that. happening to you. Yeah, you something you know? like that because it is, it, there is so much psychology involved. And um, uh, yeah, the, the bureaucracy are really against me and, and they, um, there's no questioning of it. You know, it's about, this is the, someone's an, on our team or their team, our team. Um, they're against the organisation, therefore, uh, and you could see it happening in, in defence because uh, the lawyers do the inquiries. We look into when someone's made a complaint of being raped or shot uh, by their own people or whatever. And invariably, the idea is, uh, without anyone having to say it, uh, the lawyer looks into it and says, basically, there's no case to answer for <laughs> by defence, unless it's, unless it's some, someone lower down. You might say, yeah, corporal blogs, blogs should be punished. But if it's general, it's like, oh, no, no, you know, everything was done correctly and Private Smiggins uh, raped herself, you know, obviously <laughs> made this up, you know. Right. You know, that's, uh, you might, and you might spend a year researching that and it's all very beautifully written and it's over 20 pages and, you know, but that's basically what you're meant to do is to meant to shut it down. And this is one of the frustrations I had when I was a lawyer complaining because I knew the tactics. I knew what they'd be doing, that they would look into it, they would take all the oxygen out of it and they would they would subtly shut it down. And then no right. Sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, doesn't it? Does. Where you're sort of able to see the future and it just kind of unfolds in front of you. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. It was a bit like that. And with a bit of amphetamine, you could really see the future. But and it was, and I said, "Good, you know." And uh, but that, that's that's um, that was one of the problems. That was and that was one that was when I was going through my heavy drinking phase because you could it was hard to see an end to it. There was no right of appeal. Uh, I went and saw the police. Uh, they weren't. They basically said, "Well, if the government does something, they weren't bad." And, and that, but they did say, that "If the government does something, you know." It can't be illegal. And they didn't even get me in to see a lawyer. Um, and so, yeah, you do get that, that Kafkaist feeling, of, well, where am I going to go from here? And that was, yes. that's why, you know, I'm going to keep going on about this. My but the independent voices in media, from whatever, are so important because you don't really have anywhere else to go if you're someone like me. And you will just die in a prison cell or, you know, suicide through... Uh, Drink and drugs abuse because if if you don't have anyone that uh, is an outlet, um, it's because there isn't it, 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 in the military that there was no right of appeal from internal complaints. The police didn't want to know because they'd say, "Oh, that's not our um, area," or, or it's the government doing it illegal. Um, and uh, there, there, there's nowhere else. There's no ICAC, so um, it's um, uh, yeah. So an independent person 
even 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 you are when you talked about the bureaucracy training in some ways you are the antidote to that because you are training people to think for themselves you know what, what on whatever it is they might they might disagree with you or something they laugh but they they what they want you and they realize that they don't necessarily have to toe the party line there is a uh, there is an alternative because you're right I don't think that, I've never saw the PowerPoint where they're saying we must always put people down you know <laughs> we must always break the law it, but it, it, there is some sort of uh, implicit understanding yeah, people, is it? they do it yeah mm. it's toe the line and so whatever we can do to, to counteract that's important that's true I also do think that as you've obviously, you actually just identified it as well. You talk to the average Australian and they don't really have any skin in the game other than what's right and what's wrong. And it is remarkable to see that tradies who previously had no interest in politics whatsoever, you say, these are the facts. And because they don't have all of those mm. little blocks in their mind, yeah. they're just like, yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the tradies. And that is the good. average person, but you... Yeah. I suppose, have just been in that world your entire life. And so you yeah. kind of think, fuck, this is Australia. Yeah, yeah, you that's know? right. That's exactly right. That's why it was depressing for me because I, that's, I did, opposite to you, I grew up in a very establishment sort of thing and so, and, and my world was that they, they were completely malleable. They weren't going to support me. They, they would support whatever furthered their own careers. But that mm. was, you know, mm. and uh, mm. a lot of people so used to say to me, and again, that these educated the lawyers would say, Oh, you know, you don't start a fight, you can't win. And they, they thought that was they thought that was gospel. And they, and they thought I was mad. First rule of battle. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the first rule of fucking Holocaust. And um <laughs> and yet they and they thought that I was mad to want to take on them. They never, you know, that you, you so the fact that he doesn't factor in, no, does it? No. no. It was like, oh, you know, you, you know, don't start a fight, you, you know. And the, the idea that you you have to fight the battles that you need to fight was didn't didn't occur to them. And these are people with they've probably got masters degrees in leadership, <laughs> <laughs> read a PhD on it, could bring a tear to your eye telling your story about it. But then it was like in reality it was like oh you're not going to win, you know you've got to support your boss. That's the, the boss is the one that gives you the pay rise. Mm. Um, Yours is a particularly stressful one as well because you really are stabbing at the heart of darkness. Your enemy, I suppose, is the empire. Yeah, it is a bit. And that, that's good that you say it because I sometimes think, I think that to myself and then I get, think you're getting carried away. <laughs> but because when, cause when you draw it back, but when you draw it back, when you say, because, yeah, look, I'm going at the, the lies in the Australian government, but you think, who do they follow? You know, we take orders from the US or whatever. And, and, and when you really draw it back in a scientific way, you think, who are you taking on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it goes all the way <laughs> to the president. You're trying to burn down the White House. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's kind of... I remember saying that to my now ex-wife, who remember my night, I said, look, I'm going to be with somebody, I'm going to take the documents. And she said, wait, so you're going to be taking on the whole Australian defence force? And I said, yeah, and... <laughs> <laughs> and the CIA kind of. <laughs> and the yeah, yeah. The, the well, taking of, on the Australian Defence Force uh, as an appetizer. Uh, uh, moving on to the main, the CIA, <laughs> <laughs> and for dessert, the White House. I'm going to burn down the White House. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like, you're like yeah. hats off to you. <laughs> you. Good luck with that. I hope you don't mind, honey. <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a bit ambitious plan. It's yeah, an ambitious yeah. plan. I hope you succeed. Um, and but it, it'll be like the domino. So if you can prove that you do have to tell the truth and you, that you do have to stand up for what is right, uh, a lot of dominoes will fall. And I think that's why the Julian Assange case scares them so much. Because if it if he gets off. Um, you know, he probably has to go to America to face trial. But if it, 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 the only conclusion you'd have to make was that he exposed uh, serious wrongdoing, murders, and, and not just by people at the bottom of the pyramid, but people at the top of the pyramid. And as a result, you know, people like Hillary Clinton, Mike Pompeo, all, all these key people, and, and if they went down, um, 
wrongdoing was proved against George W. Bush or Cheney or whatever, where do we go from here? You know, they're all connected. Yeah. You know, they're all connected to each other. Mm. Uh, they were all either all the current, it's the same in Australia, you know, all the current uh, leadership now were all like the second and third in command 20 years ago. So you can imagine, like Scott Morrison was the state director at the time of the Iraq war, um, state director of the Liberal Party, you know, 20 years ago. So if, if John Howard um, or any of those people, that, those, those dominoes or those uh, people in the cards in the House of Cards, if any of them were, were implicated, the rest would be in trouble as well because you'd say, well, you, you did what they asked. You were part of their team. You were a... So it's... And, and they can't have... For Assange to get off, you know, to a certain extent, it's an admission of guilt that the empire is flawed. Mm. Uh, and and mm. you have to, you could clean out the whole team, of course, but that would be a, you know, that would involve a lot of people. See, but here's the problem. Who's left to clean them out? <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the problem. Us. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you're going to be president of the United States <laughs> no. after this. Well, I mean, there are good people. There are good people. Tulsi Gabbard. You know, there, there are... And she they, seems decent, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, you can tell that she's decent because the Democrats won't even let her, you know, be on the short yeah, list. Yeah, only Tucker Carlson interview her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they won't even let her be on the short list for the nomination. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, actually, I know this is kind of off topic, but I was just because I, I, I keep seeing you say this point in the interview, first off, which is great that you keep saying it, really, uh, the Afghani and Iraq war were kind of just a money making scheme. Um, but the other thing, how you just kept saying that we just weren't winning at any point. And then I was thinking about it as a military man, this is just a purely tactical question. Is it ever possible to win against an opponent that is doing guerrilla warfare tactics? Can you win against that? No, not really. And this is quite yeah. funny. And and but people like a lot of the uh, areas that we'll talk about, and this is why it's such a house of cards. People make money out of saying that you can. You know, with David Kilcullen's of the world, people. People uh, will sell you a book. In fact, it was exposed back in, it's funny how repetitive, well, back in the Vietnam War, someone wrote, a, Americans had this theory and, and a guy who was obviously a real showman, um, he, uh, he sold, he was, an Amer he was an advisor and, he, and he, uh, he'd been in the military, I think, and he left it. And he said, yeah, we can win. We just need to win the hearts and minds over and we show them how good capitalism and we go to the villages and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the Americans went on this to say, yeah, yeah, you know, it's because the communists are so bad and if we give people playing cards and, you know, Cadillacs or whatever, you know, we, they, they will, will win them over. And uh, this journalist, Neil Sheehan, who wrote for the New York Times, it, he exposed it, it was, you know, called The Bright Shining Light. It, well, it took him 10 years to write it, won a Pulitzer. But to, to say that that was, they knew that that was never going to work. And that was well. I didn't necessarily know, but that was never going to work. Mm. And it was it was it, it was nice because it sh sold the Disneyland idea that America is so incredibly good. Everyone wants to be Americans <laughs> at heart. Inside every Vietnamese is an American waiting to get yes, out. Yeah. And if only we show them that we will win. Mm. And um, but they tried the same thing in Afghanistan. And uh, in reading another Pulitzer Prize written book uh, by a guy called Steve Cole. And he points out the same. The Americans were scratching their head. Uh, Afghanistan had gone quite well in the first couple of years. And then in 2006 and seven, it started to fall apart. Uh, and then this new phenomenon, suicide bombers. And they tried to work out why. Typical, this is so typical, the comedy that was the war. They sent along some guy from MIT <laughs> to, 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 to study why, why the, where are the suicide bombers, hoping that it was going to be some sort of they're being made in a factory, from, you know, <laughs> tortured, whatever. <laughs> and the fact, the terrible news that they, of course, the American military did not want to hear was that they're accused of suicide bombers because you've invaded Iraq and uh, it, it's a complete abomination and, the, you know, the Islamic world is up in arms about it. They can't believe that the world community is not doing it and now they're all prepared to die in Afghanistan or wherever. 
and they and they have more mm. they have more volunteers for suicide bombers than they have explosive, and it's because of America's continued policy. And and rather than say shit, Iraq was a mistake. They were like, you know, we need to kill the suicide. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> it never occurs to. And even this book's a bit like that. It's quite American centric, and it. it, it even though he, he writes about the mistakes of America, he never really gets to the point of view to say that if you were a, a poor uh, you know, tribesman Muslim living in the sort of uh, Pakistani-Afghan border region and you saw American oil companies come in, Americans bribing your local politicians, Americans do, Americans paying the Mujahideen to kill the Russians and then getting out. If you saw all this double dealing, um, you're not a psycho terrorist. You know, you're a, you're a nationalist sort of hero. You want to fight uh, corruption, sleaze, and uh, they're not. Um, you know, it's easy to paint them as terrorists, but they they were sick of the American meddling in the Middle East in a really corrupt, self-serving manner. Mm. Uh, and mm. in order to actually uh, fight the problem, America had to change the way that they did business in that area part of the world. It wasn't a matter of just whack a mole every time someone came up, but to actually consider why people in that part of the world hated America mm. and maybe change that. Mm. You know? <laughs> you know? But of course, that did never occur to them to no, say, no, you know, maybe, we should, if maybe we shouldn't invade mm. countries and we shouldn't, you know, put in puppet regimes and then, you know, kill all the odd people. Maybe, maybe we'll, just, we'll just kill all them <laughs> rather than actually. Look at the root cause problem. Maybe yeah, that's too that's too edgy. Uh, but yeah, no, it was never we we're never going to win that. And uh, it's um, yeah, just killing people was and and that was we knew that just killing people. Uh, it, it, you could see it in your own forces. If my boss had been killed, I'd be be secretly happy. You say, right, I've got promoted. Killing, killing the middle ranking. They don't even cry about that. They might pretend to cry or, you know, Abdul's been You get at the funeral. You get, yeah. his, you get his things on and put them on. Yeah, it looks like I'm captain now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what happened. They, it, it didn't stop them at all. In fact, you know, it, 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 they had plenty of recruits. Um, it was their country. Um, and uh, we were invading their country. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, trying to snuff out any more than it would happen here as a country, you know, if the Russians, Americans, Chinese invaded here, we would win an insurgency. We, we, it would know, be bloody and it would be all those things. But the, the local people will always fight. Mm. And, and no matter how much propaganda you put out on one or how uh, much torture you do on people, they will always going to beat you eventually. Mm. Mm. Um, and... It, 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 to win a war, you need to have the moral high ground. I know this is all a bit air, but I, I've thought about it a lot. The reason we did well in the Second World War is because we did have the moral high ground. The Nazis had, had invaded France and they'd, uh, the Japanese had invaded a lot of countries they didn't have a right to. They treated a lot of people very badly. And we, we you had that moral high ground. We, we didn't have that in Iraq. We didn't even have it in Afghanistan. In that the, the Taliban didn't do the 9-11 um, uh, Bombing. In fact, for people, one of the interesting inside information is that the 9-11 uh, bomb likely had training in the, you know, in the richer countries in the Middle East and that they knew their way around an aeroplane. You couldn't get that in the mountains of Afghanistan. Mm. And, of course, we like to think, we think of them as like wearing turbans and whatever, but they, when they did their training, well, they did their flight training in America, they're wearing suits and in, that, in those areas where... There's a lot of handshake agreements. If, if, if 10 men in a suit come along to a certain airport and because someone's cousin's brother has said that they're there to train, they're, they're going to train. No, one's, you know, no one knows whether they're, they're special forces or, mm. or whether there's someone else or mm. whether, mm. as we see a lot of the time, like, they're a little bit, bit of combination of both. They're local people sponsored by the intelligence services to run... Campaigns. I mean, we do the same thing. The Americans have plenty of uh, forces working for the CIA who are ex-military and sometimes not even ex-military, and they run power, you know, deniable paramilitary operations, not unlike hijacking airplanes, uh, but they're actually working for intelligence services. The, 
like a star east of the same thing in your mind. So it's there are there are lots of anyway, it wasn't the Afghans, it wasn't clearly the Afghans' fault, but we used it for an invasion. We didn't have the moral high ground. We weren't we weren't truly there to help the Afghan people. And that meant that it was always going to be doomed to failure. If you don't have uh, a true uh, a goal, um, it's not you know, a war is not going to work. Yeah, because the, the, no matter it's how it's pretty incredible, it's kind of the the moral of Terminator. Yeah, it's just like up against technological arch, the human spirit <laughs> will prevail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it sounds corny, and that's why I put it. But it's it true, aside. though. But it is true. Well, and it's someone, proven. I, I mean, someone I've thought about for you know, yeah. And it is proven. And, you know, if you look at all the wars that have been won, if you don't have that kind of right, you it's, yeah, that's, I know, it's corny, but it's sort of true. Yeah. And and why did they win with, um, you know, flip-flops, broken AK-47s, and, uh, and and we've got drones, we've got everything, and they still won. Yeah. Uh, it's it's some we don't want to admit, and then we're queuing up to fight China. And it's like without saying, "Hang on, <laughs> so you think, the technological you think, advantage." You think we need to uh, change teams or change tactics? Like if it was a football team, we wouldn't be going into the next season without a new coach. <laughs> yeah, we've so got the wooden spoon, and we're getting ready yeah, to go to the playoffs. Right, reverse under twelve leads. Let's go for Manchester um, United this time. And we're saying, <laughs> "What's what's the plan this time, coach?" Well, same as before. Why would we change it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's kind of, and that's what, as a professional soldier, as I said, I do kind of see myself as a soldier, and that bothered me more than anything else. I get a lot of hate because they, they, you know, people paint me as some sort of peacenik who can't handle a bit of, can't handle a bit of argy bargy, killing a few civilians. That's what war is about. So every, you know, every backyard soldier thinks, but it's not about that. Um, it's. Uh, uh, you're not going to win wars if you fucking don't know what you're And also, and by saying, uh, the, the PR people running the war, and by saying you're winning when you're not really winning, how's that going to go? Because you, you're not changing the tactics that aren't working. Now, mm. It's all very well to say, oh, um, you know, insurgency is hard, sure, but we knew what we were doing wasn't working and we should have ch changed tactics, but we didn't. We just said, just say it's working, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to win the war on terror by saying, and because the, win, the war on terror was effectively a political war, and as long as you had photos of people being blown up um, and uh, stories in the newspaper of hero, you would get elected, and that was the real goal. It didn't really matter what happened in Afghanistan because um, uh, you saw the, the the sort of terrible, the full circle that the guy that really sort of suffered the most political damage for Afghanistan is Biden, who, of course, is the least culpable of anybody. Uh, and yet he had to, everyone was like, well, kick it down the road, kick it down the road. And mm. then um, it, it becomes, him. yeah, it becomes someone else's problem. It mm. was all right when we were running it. You know, mm. Of course it mm. wasn't, mm. but you managed to cover up that, uh, the truth. And um, so, and that's how the wars are written. And, and, and you see it with the police as well, uh, that they, the, the the goal is not to get someone in jail or even to stop a future terrorist attack. The goal is to get a newspaper headline saying Muhammad Al Fazi from Western Sydney has been arrested, and and the police case says he was trying to blow up the Harbour Bridge and behead people and whatever. And it's all actually, if you read the closely, it's all the police allege that. Five years later, the case gets thrown out of court. Of course, there was never any such evidence, or they've got the wrong guy or whatever, but they don't care because the cop has got promoted because he's got this big arrest and the, and the press were there. And so it, it's become wag the dog kind of thing where the story um, is the victory because that will get you ahead in your career. Uh, and as a professional soldier, this bothers me because we're losing wars. If we ever had to fight a real war now, we would lose because we're so... We've just so focused on the on the, the war of PR, the PR war, that no one actually does the real war anymore. In fact, most of the unbelievable, most of the things that you, most of the things you know about the defence force are just PR stuff. And and the only plan this is it's quite you're smart enough to get it. But it was hard to get a journalist to get this to say. The, I know this because the only plan uh, supporting this latest initiative would be um, a, a plan, a PR plan based on polling. P 
people will like this if we appear to do such and such, our approval rating will go up. And, oh there, and there won't be any other study saying this will protect us from China or, you know, whatever. If it's like the only study that supported the action was this will make people like us. And I found that as a professional soldier, I just found that, you know, it, it drove me. And even when that's why I was so determined, even when the, the journalist said, you understand you're going to be in the frame for this, I was like, I don't care. I'm so angry about this, the fact that we're not protecting the country. Um, I wish there was a movie about that angle. It's hard Instead to of sell. all the bloodiness, it would be really nice to see something along the lines of, I don't know, yes, minister or something about the general sitting there and just yeah. being like, yeah, it's a good photo, you know. Yeah, it's <laughs> a good photo. Yeah, yeah. A green screen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't do that after the fall of Kabul, that they didn't do a green screen of children and... Crabs. Look at Kabul. Don't believe it. That's all wrong. <laughs> and, you know, they have such blanket coverage now. That's why I was so happy because that was, that was the, probably the first truth I'd seen come out of Afghanistan. Was all, and I remember it so well, that US helicopter take off. And it's funny how we, we made fun of the Iraqis back in 2003, chemical or Ali or comical Ali, saying the Americans will never come into Baghdad. Um, and we did exactly the same thing, Biden. For so, 20 years. Yeah, same, but they will never, you know, I will never push us out on the embassy roof. No, so really, you know, sh- sh- right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, yeah. Uh, a Do you know what happened to that guy? <laughs> I, I don't know. Is he dead? He's probably working for the American. Yeah, maybe Democrat, he was Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably doing a good job, you know. And um, I don't know. We got a bit d- distracted from your story. Sorry but, about that. No, but, but that's no, all right. But thank you for uh, sharing that with no, me personally. It, anyway, it is interesting. <laughs> no, I like talking about it because it, and the thing, it, it, what is interesting, and again, it links back, is that that wasn't easy to get people to understand or, or care about. You know, they will care about you know a rape. Or something, which is fine. It's a big deal, but but to, to say you understand this whole war is completely, you know, they're like, oh, it's too 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 big. Don't want to know. And we were discussing it before about this is this is one of the disappointments I've had with some of the reporting on the Afghanistan, where that they are fingering the, the corporals and sort of saying this corporal shot so and so, which is true, which is bad, and that needs to be proved, but without saying. Uh, you know, the, the whole campaign was obviously misthought out. Because it, even when a corporal, while it's hard for people to accept, because, we, you know, these just say the blood, it's a very emotive. But if a corporal shoots a, uh, a civilian, it's really just breaching a law. We can shoot civilians in certain circumstances. And um, uh, so that's in itself, unless he's done it on intentionally. But, but it, and then it's a breach of the law. But for a general to bomb a village wrongly or to start a war or to lie about something, that's a breach of the law as well. It's not necessarily as a motive, but we need to, and we're not necessarily going to put generals in jail, but it would help uh, fix Australia or the Western world that much more if we we put a general or a politician on trial to say, did you lie about this? Did you purposely... um, lie about the state of the war in order to further your own career, uh, that would really shake things up rather than just putting couples on the, you know, saying... Endless promotions. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, exactly. We shake shake people up, but you wouldn't even need to put someone in jail. You just need to scare one of them because they're not pretty brave people to say, but to put someone in the box and say... um, And they might point the finger above, you know, but the politician maybe. Well, that's fine, but we need to start shaking it up and Mm. saying... um, uh, you know, you can't just put the, the people down the bottom on trial. Um, the people on the top, if they lied, um, if they covered things up, if they did self-serving uh, uh, things to further their own career, which is effectively the same as uh, murdering, they need to, you know, we need to have a, a standard measure um, on, on the top and the bottom. You know? It is a fascinating world that you inhabit. Kind of just reminds me of when I interviewed Spanion. <laughs> I want to it's, meet the Spanion. Well, you've, you've got the format now. You should do it. <laughs> he, uh, but it is that. It's, it's like you meet prisoners and you meet people in the army and it's just a, a universe that the average person doesn't interact with. 
It is different, you know? yeah, and it's and and yet that we I often think that, and this is one of the problems when my case um, soldiers are, are not. We look like you know we look like normal people, but we're not. You know we're like aliens. Even when we're based in Sydney or um, Canberra or whatever, the way I guess the brainwashing works, whatever. But the way you think is all different. I mean, you you you're, you in the military it sounds a bit. Um, melodramatic, but it's a fact, you know, your, your boss can send you to your death, you know, you can't sort of say, well, fuck that, I'm not going <laughs> to stop part of the, you know, they can actually say, you you need to man this position and you're not going to leave and you, you, you need to stop it. And, free, and, every, and it's not theoretical. And second, what my father's and grandfather's generation happened, you know, people were told, you need to man this machine gun post, Japanese are coming and you're not leaving. Um, and uh, but in a strange sort of paradox, uh, when people give that kind of sacrifice for you, you can't bullshit to them. Too. You can't say to them, oh, "You need you, you you just need to man this machine gun post for a few hours." But that the you know you're going to be relieved. There's going to be people coming in to save you in two hours' time. You can't say that if it's not true. Mm. You know, so the your the honor and and, and the truth. It matters more than their life kind of thing. I mean, you know, uh, and this is why we get so wild about it because the idea that our generals are lying, cheating shits is, is, is really, it really burns you because you are prepared to, to give your life. It's a big ask, I mean, you know, and this is a journalist, uh, you know, it really annoyed me because he, he, he suggested that, oh, I couldn't love my children because I wouldn't have done what I did if I loved my children. But it was like, no, your duty is your duty. And just because you've got children, you can't. I mean, I couldn't have not gone to Afghanistan, even if my wife was giving birth. I, you know, if you, if you get called up, you have to go. And, um, and you have to do your duty. And that's, that's a mentality which I accept is different. Um, but you are... Uh, yeah, the truth is important, and, and and politics obviously seeps down into it. But there's a limit to how much you can seep down. I mean, and, mm. you know, you can't make political scapegoat. People that are, dedicate their lives to the service of the country should never be made scapegoats just because the wind has changed and you know, this by-election coming up or something. So I'm going to throw someone to the walls. <laughs> you know, that's you know, and you, and we need to have people. And it doubly annoyed me because all our doctrine says that. You know, it says you've got to stand up and moral courage, and you know, uh, which effectively means stand up and yeah, down. man yeah. up and take the fool for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, when I did that, you know, I didn't get any medals for it. You know, they're trying to put me in jail <laughs> for the rest of my life. So it's like it's double. It's like the pedophile priest thing. You know, you preach. It's it's worse than just being a pedophile. You're preaching one thing in the day and doing something totally the opposite, yeah. and it's really especially when it goes into people's belief systems, it's really twists their soul when they find out. Oh. You can imagine. Well, that's all I can do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but where we're going, going back to you now. So uh, our paths kind of cross. You've been doing more and more political stuff. Uh, John Barillaro, that's quite an important kind of breakthrough. Tell, tell us a bit about that. God, uh, you know what? Like, I can't say it wasn't intense, but I think that the reason that it actually, not that I'm going to take credit for him taking down it also, like it was a big team effort, obviously, you know. Um, but I do think that the reason that it has a difference from the rest of the press is first off, they're complacent and they were clearly trying to back him pretty much most of the time until, and I do think that this is the case actually, this is something that Michael West always says as well, which is that the press are so good at bayonetting the dead. You know? <laughs> you know? But like I, I, when that man had power, they weren't there. And I suppose it's not really, the thing that actually just angers me about it more than anything still to this day is just the irreversible damage that that man did to this country's environment for slight personal gain. We're not really talking about much here. We're talking about, as you're saying, you know, when, once he leaves politics, maybe a 
cozy job on this board, maybe a few donations or something. Like still to this day, that is the thing that I find outrageous about, regardless of what he did to me and Christo. It's, it's, that is, that's something that you, you're never going to get back. You know, that is permanently changed. That was the infuriating part about it. But I think that the reason that we were able to make some form of impact on it mostly is one, he just kept biting stupidly. But the second one is that I think that we made it fun. You can laugh your way through these kinds of things. Instead of just making these really dry reports about it, you can Which bring is some theatre, you can bring some, and I think that that just, it creates something that people actually want to pay attention to because it's more interesting than a lot of reality television. No, I agree. Yeah. And I think that's your big side. I mean, people, this is one of the frustrations I've had. And, and there's a lot of information out there. Like I've quoted a couple of books, you know, that really have some hard evidence. But of course, no one, no one significant has read them. Um, and, uh, whereas, you, yeah, you get people to, to watch, and you get people to as, care, the average person, as you said, and that makes all the difference. It's all very well having the facts on someone, but if, if you can't get people to care and, and a little bit of entertainment, it, it seems brilliant to me. And, and, and the, the good thing about it is it's not just theory. You, you've shown that it actually works. And I, what I loved about it um, was the way that you were like, as Michael West is the same, you were, when they sent you the letters from the lawyers, which would make a lot of people scared, you were like, bring it on. There's no way we're going to cease and desist. And I loved it. For someone like myself who kind of feels like a man on my, on my own and uh, to see somebody else say, yeah, bring it on, I'm on the fray, even though there were significant financial penalties possibly for you, uh, that, uh, that was, that, you know, courage is contagious, as they say, because the only way we're going to get change in this country is people like you who stand up and when they get a little bit of argy-bargy from the... <laughs> World's worst law for them, you know. They, uh, <laughs> you know, they just laugh at it, you know. And um, so it's good. Well, uh, I'll tell you. I think the way to go forward about that, and that's why I really respect your work as well, is because I think that there is very few people, especially in the press, that care about anything other than their own immediate interests, mm. and. As you're kind of saying, I think that only just a few people that can look beyond that for a second and think, I'm, you know, I'm going to die and the world will keep going. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So like oh, I, at I, the I, end of the day, does it really matter if you paid off your mortgage? Yeah, exactly. You know? And and that's and it's just fucked to me that a lot of the people that interpret our reality and always have, it's actually a big piece of the new stand-up show, which is that <laughs> those people have always been from a certain class and they always see the world through a certain frame. And the frame really comes from, at the end of the day, material self-interest. And so really they're kind of just in on this lie. The, 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 the reality that they're creating for everybody else to live in is just based off of, like you're talking about in the military, mm. someone wanting a promotion. Mm. And I really can't think of anything more evil than that. Yeah. But as you've proven, it, as you're saying here as well, it only takes a few people to just not think like that, especially yeah. in this day and age where you can actually get your voice out. Yeah, that's a right. Apart from and, Iranian TV. And I think you agree <laughs> that we, are, we need to have fun about it too because we, in an ideal world, people need to come after us and if they see you miserable walking around, oh, my God, you know, they've broken him like so. But, but if you have fun, as you and Christo did, I try to always keep a smile on my face no matter what I'm facing because you don't... That's part of it. If you're going to be a role model for other people, you've got to look like, you know, that it's good. But what you said, I was trying not to smile, but I had a real incredible uh, uh, similarity when you said you couldn't believe that people would sell themselves out for a banana, basically. And, and, <laughs> a monkey want banana. And that's what happened. That's what's on the defence wall. So, and especially because I, I, you know, I grew up on all the myths of the greatest yeah. generation or whatever. And... Um, I saw, and I really believed that that you die for your country and you do it, you do it greatly, you know, John Rambo sort of stuff. And then, yeah, the the the, the heads of the military, uh, and you'd think maybe you'd sell out for a, 
a, you know, a trunk full of bullion and said, sort of like. There becomes a point where you think, yeah, yeah fair yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd do if it. If you've yeah. got a secret bank account <laughs> and, a, and a villa in the south of France, <laughs> Putin style, you reckon, yeah, okay. You'd be like, mm. <laughs> Massage but, the truth. But yeah, but these guys were selling out for a broken office works chair <laughs> and, a, and a strip light in a musty camera office. And you're like, no, even, even, even our corrupt you know, military leaders are so second rate. <laughs> yes. You know, they're so second rate. A slightly upgraded, you know, fake marble kitchen in <laughs> suburbs of Canberra. You're like, there isn't even in gold bullion. It's sort of like Russian mistress. No. Nah. No, nah, yeah. Second rate. Second, second rate. rate. <laughs> second rate sellouts. And that made my blood boil as, as a sort of thing. Especially you spent 40 years in the army. And, and when you've got a choice of looking after yourselves and doing all the things that you've been speaking for 40 years and standing up for, and or a banana, <laughs> <laughs> a free lunch, and you choose the free lunch, you're like, <laughs> really? <laughs> and you can see why it kind of makes you kind of angry. You see, you know, I, I was, before I was kind of mad, but that, that you know, that's the sort of, thing that people used to get executed over, you know, it's called treason or whatever, selling out your country for some sort of, um, you know, small thing. And you're right, it, it, the, the, I'm glad to hear you use that phrase about the people who interpret our world because it's a frustration which I've seen myself. And, um, uh, but again, when, you, when you're the only one, you think you must be going crazy and you think, how am I ever going to explain this to people? But you're right to say, I don't know whether it's by accident or, or design, but the way that the paradigm is, uh, the prism with which the world is viewed, you're right, so much of it, the role models are like, get a new car, get a new house, you know, house prices are so ridiculously overdone and, and it's because of the um, uh, real estate lobby, et cetera, and, and, and there's all that. You are, you are definitely brainwashed that you, if you, you don't have a proper life until you've paid off a mortgage. Yeah, and so it, it's such tiny goals in life. I mean, what you're doing, for instance, isn't that more exciting than being like, there it is, it's done, and I'm still in the house. You know, you're like, and, and the other thing as well is when you talk to these people, it's truly remarkable to see that when you point out something like, you're doing this to pay off your mortgage, they'll see that as a noble act. Yeah. They'll see, they actually see that as a justification, even when you're pointing it out yeah. to them blank face. It's not like they're trying to hide it. Yeah, they, they actually do think this. Like, yeah. And then look yeah. at you yeah, like, yeah, you're yeah, crazy. Yeah. You're a monster because yeah. you're trying to take, you're trying to take yeah. it off me, you know? Or, yeah. I'm not going to risk it. You don't even have a house. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the argument. I know. I, I often found that, and I found that when I was trying to agitate in Canberra. This is when you believe you're an alien. And someone who was a very nice, well-intentioned person put me in touch with an ex-Air Force general equivalent, you know, a kind of lobbyist guy, and he said, this guy might be able to help you. And I went to see him and, um, and I said, look, I'm really worried that the Defence Force is being, instead of honouring their commitment to their nation, that they're becoming politicised and they're really just politicians in uniform. Mm. And this guy looked at me like, and? Of course, yeah, of course <laughs> we're politicians in the And I kind of like, oh. and I started talking about bicycles because he was a bicycle. And I thought, oh, I just wasted it. That's all. And he generally thought I was kind of mad that I didn't know that, that they were all politicians in uniform. And he was, of course I am. I might have lunch with so and so. I'll put in a good word for you at the club. <laughs> And you begin to think, shit. You beat that impasse, don't you? No, no, Where but do you he, go from there? I just had to change the subject. Checkmate. But he was, he was so lack of self-awareness when I just started talking about bicycles. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't sort of say, weren't you here to talk about... <laughs> <laughs> weren't you here to talk about something really serious? <laughs> you know, they, they, as you said, they, they're all different way of seeing things and yeah, you can't get through them. And they think you are crazy, as you said, that they would think, you know, of course, we're just politicians looking for our next free lunch and for mica table and new model Toyota, you know. <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> what, what else would you look for? Would you say? And then you'd say, well, what about, um, 
you know, when you go to military school and you say it's all about standing up and right and truth, and they'd say, yeah, you say those things because it makes people like you. <laughs> no, no, you meant to. I haven't heard that one. No, but, that's no, even but that's, worse, isn't oh, that's it? true. Oh, they would they would never <sighs> say that out loud. But there must be. There must be. You'd have to draw that conclusion to say someone like me who stood up for what I, and even my enemies say, well, he obviously believes what he believes. He's a little bit, you know, wound a bit tightly to think that truth matters as much as you know, thinks it does. <laughs> but he's obviously, you know, the documents are there, whatever. And they they have to kind of concede that. And then you'd say, well, hang on. You say that truth is one of the mainstays of of defence force. This guy you acknowledge is someone that's standing up for what is right. And you're trying to put him in jail for the rest of his life. But the, the, the three things don't fit together. There must be some different explanation to it. You know, if, if we do really believe in truth, if we do really believe in standing up and doing the right thing, if that's part of the defence force ethos, I have clearly done that. You know, why am I trying to put me in jail? Mm. And why or at least someone trying to explain? Mm. Mm. Um, and uh, like, what do they tell you? If you're day one of you know, done true today, and they give you a lecture about standing up and doing the right thing, and someone says, what about David Wyman? What do they say? <laughs> you don't know the answer. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're giving me the blame look. Well, I don't know the answer. the answer. I don't know the answer. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow I expected you to give me well, an answer. Like, yeah. <laughs> and you just blocked me. God, you were giving me a season quote. <laughs> he just blocked me. Well. Sorry about that. That's all right. So where do we go from here? Um, I think you've made a big, uh, uh, an incredibly big contribution. And it's not, you know, you obviously get haters. You obviously, if you had death threats, probably. Probably, but I just don't pay attention. This is the other thing that I hate about all the new anti-cyberbullying <laughs> laws. Yeah. You just get it after a while. If you're an internet celebrity, you just realise, oh, I don't have to check Twitter, you know, yeah. and then all of that dissipates entirely. I agree you don't with necessarily that. have to shut down the internet yeah. so that you can go on there and then it's just like, that's a nice picture of your dog. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm obviously relatively new to all this, but yeah, I did. I I chuckled to myself a bit um, when I read that. It, it, much as you know, some of the hate is pretty vitriolic, but you <laughs> you really don't have to read the comments. You know, is why, why why are you going to go read? Oh my God, someone said this about me. It's like, well, what are you doing reading that? And then getting upset about it. Of course, you know, you are. Um, there are nuts out there, and you just yes. Can't <laughs> That's the only yeah. Now they have a voice. Yeah. Now they have a voice. And more but power we all to get them. It. Yeah. <laughs> I've had plenty of hate mail, and you need to be shot. You're a traitor. Or... I'm sure you've gotten yeah. serious hate mail. Yeah, and um, and obviously, the, the, you know, things are going on behind the scenes which are much more dangerous than that. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, if you know what you're doing and, and you think what you're doing is right, um, yeah, that's the main thing. You're right, and trying to shut things down. Because I've, again, and this is to do with some links back into everything, it, that's window dressing. So much of the modern progress, they're doing that, or we're going to crack down on the internet in order to look good. They don't really care about the result. Um, I often think that it... You no, know, it's because you're allowed to speak now. That's why they're cracking down. <laughs> they're trying internet. to crack that's It's the opposite to what they're saying, yeah. They want to actually shut out. And that's, I think there's a serious element to that in that... Um, for example, I'm being prosecuted, even though it's clear, even to my enemies and whatever, no one doubts that, you know, I am a, uh, a well-educated, white-collar, middle-class guy who didn't believe what was going on with Defence Force, right? And clearly not under any definition am I a terrorist or am I a spy. Yet I'm being charged under sections which are designed for people um, who mean serious harm to this country. So that show, you know, and they would have passed them to say these are to stop the most heinous people who kind of blow, come to blow up the opera house. That's the sort of law on, and they've never charged anybody under them. It is, it, I, I do understand the sinisterness of what they're trying to do with that, but does it stick at your craw the most? I suppose the fact that what you're getting tried under 
is the exact opposite of the truth because that's the thing that always it seems to actually really bug you as well yeah. the fact that the people that are constantly saying we're standing up for freedom and liberty are really the only threats to freedom and liberty uh -huh. and i think that's the same thing that actually whenever we're doing a video about you for instance that's the thing that always sets me off yeah. is the fact that there are legitimate traitors to this country in yeah. the military that you're constantly pointing out and you're the one that's tried as a traitor. I know, that's why, I mean, it's good that you get it and it's water to, you know, water in the desert to hear that because I begin to think that a lot of people don't get that, but to say, obviously, especially like the conservative Australian readers that say, he's a traitor, you should never, I often get people say, well, no matter what happened, you should never release the secrets and you're like, <laughs> You know, the purpose... Yeah, it's so good. The, that guy there, that guy. never in your position, uh, never close yeah, yeah. before. Yeah, you, gets, you get a lot of people like how moral no, I am. No, 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 I know all about this. But you're like, <laughs> well, um, you understand we're there to protect the country and, and you know, a leadership which kind of lies the whole time is more of a threat to our national security. I mean, you obviously Absolutely. get that. But a lot of people don't seem to get that. You know, if we have a completely hopeless, corrupt defence force... We're not going to fucking beat Fiji, and um, probably not. <laughs> well, probably we, I don't not. think we would now. We just put out the PR campaign. We'll be saying thrashed Fiji. <laughs> Meanwhile, every guy was wooden gloves in camera, <laughs> going through Parliament House. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but um, they, because uh, they've probably got the moral high ground. But the, uh, it's. Yeah, it matters. If we if we are dirty, rotten, lying cheats, that is national security. Oh, it really is because uh, the the thought that I had when that uh, I can't even remember his name, but the 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 you know the Afghani president just going off in the helicopter as soon as there was a was moment a, of you mean a wonderful cash. brave ally, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ally in the in the war on terror. That's so good, that's my cute action. How do you guys? His Excellency KCMG Afghani. <laughs> Afghani. Yeah. But that was the immediate thought. My immediate thought was, fuck, if Scott Morrison was in that same position, <laughs> absolutely he would. Probably before, because he's probably got better communication methods than they do. So he probably would have left weeks, gone. you know, out of there. Yeah. Obviously, that's the thing that I think everybody got pissed off with, with out of the bushfires. But yeah. I think that that is, you're right, like at the core of it, the real danger to society is people in charge that are completely motivated by self-interest and, you know, as a result of that, say anything to stay there. Yeah, I know. And that's, that's what's really inspiring about you taking on the entire octopus that you are. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. It's nice because you do wonder whether you're a bit crazy because I've often, that does make your blood boil. You think, I'm a threat to national security. And... Um, you are one of the few people that kind of say that because you don't even get it, even in your supporters, often people don't make the connection to say, if we have a sort of total quizzling, you know, collaborator leadership, we are not safe. You know, we are not safe from anything. Mm. Um, and, and to a certain extent, the pandemic has brought that out because they haven't been able to PR it. And the only thing that they, um, that they know it has is to do polling with Crosby Texter. What does the polling say? The people of marginal seats want us to do this, get in the ute, whatever. And and unless they have that, they don't know how to handle anything. But the army was becoming the same thing. That you you can only really lead a, a country if you led a you know a state or you led. Uh, that's one advantage Americans have in that you you have to work your way up. Um, but these people have never led anything apart from an opinion poll and press conference. And so if they do get a proper issue, um, they don't know what to do. And, and this is Check why I think they didn't know what to do in the Link Cafe seat and they let those two innocent people because they couldn't do the polling quick enough. I mean, Tony, this shows you Tony Abbott, I've known him a long time. You reckon this sort of real man or whatever, he would have just said, I'm stepping in, which he had the power to do, uh, I'm taking control, I'm the Prime Minister, you're going to shoot uh, the terrorists dead, claims to be part of ISIS, which they could have done. But he wouldn't give the order because they don't, I think they didn't, he'd never really been in a proper leadership position um, and everything they did was based on polling of marginal seats and they couldn't turn around the polling. You know. They're not used to actually saying, this is what I'm going to do, I'll take the heat for it. 
Um, it really is really the problem me. of living in a country that's just had so easy of a ride, isn't it? Yeah. That there is yeah. just that class of people that can well, just can, get fat off it. Yeah, and, 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 and it becomes self-perpetuating. They select the, the worst person gets selected rather than the best person. Yes. The most venal, the most, you know, the person who really um, knows how to work. To Who's system. willing to cover up other people yeah. and you have enough Suck shit up. on them that you can take them yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Suck up. Who's got all the worst qualities. Right. <laughs> get ahead. You know. The biggest suck up to the boss, the person that runs down the uh, opposition, the person that never makes a decision if they, you know, if it's they can possibly avoid of it. It's amazing generals yeah. having yeah. those traits. And they get yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you're right, it's a serious business. And the idea that, you know, you are meant to be everything good, but you are actually everything bad, it's, it, it, it makes your blood boil. You kind of think. Mm. Um, and what's more, you're able to put people that call you out, you're able to crush them. Mm. Um, uh, and, yeah, the leaders are increasing like that. They don't um, – uh, we seem to have the worst and, – and you see it with Gladys Berejiklian and whatever. She refused to even admit she never did anything wrong. And mm. that shows you the sort of um, – the glass house that they live in. Oh, mm. Barilaro. Oh, yeah, we throw money around um, – um, on car parks or whatever. Something like, wrong with that? Yeah. We, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with that? Isn't that the purpose of politics? And they're not necessarily joking. <laughs> Talking to other people that do it. I know. They say that into a camera. And of all these journalists as well that are probably sitting there being like, yeah, it's a good The chin scratches go, yeah. 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 Well, that's an <laughs> that's a side inter- of the story. Interesting <laughs> interpretation. I read about that at university. Yes. <laughs> Because they're probably rorting their own tax or whatever. <laughs> but, um, but you're right, the idea that uh, they can say that. And um, I often used to think that about Christian Porter, that maybe he was a really funny guy and, and he, would, he would go back after a day's work and just laugh about the stuff that he used to say and think, I got away with saying that, you know. <laughs> I got away with, you know, using my power to the Attorney General to censor out, you know, a critical paragraph in the auditor's report which criticised a liberal donor and I said, that's national security. <laughs> and I got away with it. And when they said, you can't do that, I said, I'm the Attorney General. <laughs> and I got away with it. I always used to think he used to just laugh and belly laugh and slap his like, I never guess what I got away with. Um, because some of the things that they got away with were just like, how could you possibly do that? You know? mm, mm, um, mm. You know, it was almost like it was a joke and you would wonder, are, are they people with really wicked sense of humour to think? But, um, you know, and then he came crashing down. But they would... I think it's just everything becomes normal. Yeah. If you're in an environment, it becomes normal. It's the, Which is more of a testament to you. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, that's right. It probably goes back to that. Because I wasn't, you know. I was always an outsider. So it's very easy for me to sit there and then throw stones at people that I'm not friends with and I don't go to dinners with. But for you to just turn your back on all of that and stick up for principles, as is evidenced by the fact that you're basically the only one that has, <laughs> it shows how rare it is. It's rare and that's important. That's why my case is, I think it's a really important test case because I think you're right. Even with Julian Assange, he's an outsider. He's a, he's a computer, a hacker, but he's he obviously involved in that world. Um, and... Uh, even uh, Snowden was a contractor. He, tried, he was quite a patriot. He wanted to get in, but but I am someone who is very much inside the system. You know, I yeah. Wouldn't, I would and not you be broke out of the matrix. You know, I would not be doing this unless I thought it was. I mean, there's nothing in it for me. I've lost my job. No. I lost my marriage. I almost lost my life. There is no self-serving motive, but just to say, I suddenly struck me that we were the we were not the good guys. We were the bad guys. And something had to be done about. It. You know, mm, mm. Um, and uh, that's important. Maybe that's why they they want to fight my case hard because it will it will be a significant crack in the damn wall and say, hang on, someone um, someone from really with within. And I was in the Liberal Party beforehand. Um, uh, you know, I was in the on the state a delegate in the state council. You know, I voted for Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott are friends. Uh, so I'm really much an insider, but for me to say, wow, I have seen, and I've seen all, well, a lot of very top secret documents and, and putting the tapestry together, uh, it's, it's not good, you know. We have, no. we have the, the, the country has, lot, you know, we've gone off the rails, you know. And, 
we are, <sighs> so yeah, and, and hopefully we, we can reverse that trajectory. Uh, but I can't do it without people like you. Um, I would easily, uh, people like our mutual lawyer, Mark Davis, would be in jail uh, now without him. Because you do get that sort of, um, you know, that fatalism. And, um, yeah, no, it's, it, 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 and, and a lot of support out there, which is great. But you get support, again, from, from, from publicity, and you get publicity from people like you, and you, and, uh, uh, and you get education. Uh, and I will say it is a real testament to the Australian people that they do side with you. I really do think that. Yeah, no, I, I think really it, do. Well, it, 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 do, it, it, does, it does show that, that most people are actually decent, hard work and folk. It does swell your heart. Yeah, you get a letter from, you know, John Miggins and Miss, and their their empty nesters driving around Australia and the grey nomads, and he's an ex-cop and she's an ex-something or other school teacher, and they write and say, "Here's a, a check for twenty thousand twenty dollars." You know, we don't trust the banks, <laughs> and that warms your heart. You Doesn't know, it's it? Every yeah. day. Real Aussies, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a, here, here, People that actually don't have that much to give as well. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those small donations and they, yeah, it, the average Australian is a very good person. They don't necessarily understand the big issues, but they, but as you said, you, you, if you They know it, what's right and wrong. Yeah, they know that that's bullshit. They yeah. say, look, you're, you're someone that, you know, gave his life for this country or, you know, dedicated his life to this country and, and um, uh, you got children, you had a lot to lose, but you, uh, you thought that this was the right thing and um, I'd like to help you. Good on you. Keep going. And that means the world. You're right. And that is one really nice thing to say that there are a lot of fantastic Australians out there. Yeah. Um, and you must see it, you know, in, in your own supporters, young people uh, who kind of are quite politically savvy and, uh, and, and are able to laugh at what you do. And that's nice to say and because they've got to be relatively... Um, you know, educated, they're the future. Well, actually, that's the really interesting part about satire. I used to think that, but then I read a book called The John Stewart Effect. <laughs> and isn't this incredible? His audience was more educated on politics than any other program in America. Uh, New York Times, CNN, all of them, very distant scores to what John Stewart's audience was and everybody else's audience were the people that you're talking about, the chin scratchers, right? They're right. the only ones that actually engage in the propaganda model. Everyone else is watching sport. But John Stewart's audience was comprised of people that worked at Macca's, you know? And there was college students in it, but it was a mix of people. Mm. There was people that had no college education at all, not even a high school education. They'd be watching John Stewart and they knew more about the political system than someone who read the New York Times. It's interesting, isn't it? I guess... The, uh... You'd be too frustrated otherwise, but that's, yeah, that's it. I think it's just because it's deliberately designed to be boring. And these people are extremely boring. I can't handle it. Even putting aside those, th those kind of really stuffy dinners that you're talking about, right? How they just sit there and it's very tense and they've got their little pre-approved topics that they're allowed the to speak about, about, the classical music in the background. Now, but, what postcode do you live in? Yeah. <laughs> house price has gone up there. <laughs> How much has your house gone up in the past year? It's not mine. That's the whole thing. And then school, rugby. And then it, that's about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, those things. Yep. Uh, something about like what is in the news at the moment, which I think is why they, they tune into it so that they can appear worldly. And I really do think that... Uh, it's, it's obviously targeted to those people that need to push the buttons to keep society going, obviously, is that form of indoctrination. But there's also the other aspect, which is it's deliberately boring. If you read the Sydney Morning Herald, you will think that politics is the most mundane, just nothing interesting is mm. happening ever. Keep your attention away from it. You know, that's why there's all these other like programs that are just kind of aimed at the masses that have nothing to do with your world and how, <laughs> you know, just basic civic things of you should be paying attention to who's spending your money and on what, you know, mm. that's the distractionary part. So if you can make it entertaining enough, because mm. as you know, it actually is extremely interesting. The stories mm. that you tell me about in the military, it's a sitcom. 
Yeah, they, yeah. they could be sitcom characters. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. And, and that's what I hope to do one day is, to, is for some sort of movie or TV. I'd love it. Because the only way you're ever going to get the story across is through popular, you know, something like that. And yeah. It is, it is an interesting story. It is. And sometimes you don't even realise it yourself because when you're living in that world all the time, you don't, you don't realise it. Yeah, but but it you've is. stepped back and you've yeah. looked at it and, yeah, yeah you've it obviously is. pointed out the absurdities. Well, of it's it. got everything, you know. Life, yes. yes, it does. Life, death. <laughs> You know, imprisonment, um, family, drug use, it's, it's, it's all there. And, um, uh, yeah, so it, and it, and it affects us, you know. If, 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 if a government is lying to us about important things and nothing ever gets done about it, I mean, that, that affects you. Right? You can't say that doesn't affect you. Mm, mm. Um, and uh, it's all very well to your son or daughter gets taken away by the police or, or that you want to have a... Fact, that's not even hypothetical anymore. I mean, we saw that with, with Christo, your producer. Mm, mm. I mean, say he'd been killed, say he died in custody, say that, you know, say that it, it had been more serious. Well, there would have been no comeback for that. And, and that's how you get terrorists, like in Saudi Arabia. There's a good, a good sometimes you get more uh, truth from fiction than you, than you can in, in the, um, you know, non fiction. But it was. Uh, called I Am Pilgrim, and it's quite a good story, a narrative about how a terrorist is formed. And his father gets taken off in Saudi Arabia and executed. And uh, he, that doesn't make him a terrorist, um, but him trying to get justice and then being thwarted at every turn, um, that makes him, when he, be, when he begins to see it's not just a mistaken you know, murder, but the whole system is totally corrupted and every time he tries to, to get some sort of a justice, there is, there is some corrupt official in the pay of the US in his way, and uh, after three of those steps, he becomes like a heart. You know, the only way to fight this is through absolutely, you know, serious violence. Mm. And, and and you know, in Christo's case, someone that could have been worse. In, in South America, that's the sort of thing where he might have disappeared. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're not that far away from that because there yes. isn't any comeback. You know, well, that was the big reminder. I think that's why it affected everybody. Yeah, but to say. thankfully, he's a zoomer, and so his camera is basically attached to his hand at this point. And the fact that he was able to get that footage really showed exactly that yeah. point that it's yeah. not that far off. And it illustrated your, you know, your your the, the truth that if it's not on YouTube, it didn't kind of happen. <laughs> and, 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 and a little sort of story, a footnote in that Sydney Morning Herald on page five, it was going to happen. It mm. disappeared. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, could have gone the other way. Maybe, maybe, maybe he antagonised a police officer. You know, you know who knows? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, there was no cameras there. Yeah, yeah. You know, meanwhile, he's dead, and um, <laughs> and, and they're enemies of the state. And yeah. um, uh, uh, it, that's we need to guard against that, and we need to stand up and the truth is the truth and, and the law is a law uh, and uh, we're probably ready for lunch I think yeah <laughs> probably but but I want to thank, thank you, you so much I don't know who was interviewing to who it doesn't matter um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, I'm really grateful because just, yeah but you're more interesting than I uh, let's just put it that way well, as I said, I, I think it's. I want to do. I want to interview more people like yourself because it it, it, it is important. The independent voices. I've said it before, but um, uh, it doesn't matter what spectrum you're from. But uh, listening to those who are not afraid to uh, do things outside the, the narrative, um, you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the, yeah, a lot depends on keeping that, that flame burning. Um, so I'm very grateful to you and I hope, uh, yeah, I can't, I th can't thank you enough for giving up your time. Thank you, war hero. <laughs> thank you for all the work <laughs> you do. Thank you, Mark. Let's have lunch. <laughs> <laughs>